again, a warm welcome to all of you and a special welcome uh, to our newcomers and guests. And we pray that the Advent season is a hopeful and joyful time as we journey uh, toward not only the birth of Jesus, but the coming of Christ again and the fullness of God's kingdom. So again, a warm welcome to all of you. And we do hope you'll stay uh, for Coffee Fellowship after the service today. So the season of Advent is four weeks, and we've been journeying in the theme of Christmas gifts that will not break, looking at those true gifts beyond things that we buy or give away or search for on Amazon, real gifts that, that are, are, are rooted in the gift of Jesus. So love, and we've talked about hope, and today we talk about joy. It's interesting in the tradition of the church for many centuries the third Sunday of Advent is Joy Sunday, in France it's called Gaudet Sunday, which basically means light or lighter. It just is this beautiful gift that the candle is somewhat brighter as a sign of the gift of joy. And so, what, what is joy? So maybe you know somebody named Joy, amen, or maybe you use it to wash your dishes, I don't know, but it's a little bit more than that, right? It's a lot more than that. And so, if we look at our Hebrew understanding of joy, there are five words in Hebrew that represent different aspects and experiences of joy. Uh, simcha, which is just basically the deep sense of joy and happiness that comes by being connected to God. Then there are four other words for them. One, just specifically around the joy that comes from dancing. Amen? So, uh, so the Hebrew people and our Jewish heritage uh, reflects into us this deep sense of joy being a part of life, especially in the context of praise worship, and thanksgiving, and gratitude. Now, in the Greek, of which the New Testament was written, the joy, or the word for joy is basically based on a word called kara, uh, or, or karaton, or uh, there's some, or kairos, or kairon. So these words are all kind of variations, which might mean rejoice, or joy, and they're deeply connected to the multiple meanings of the Hebrew word. But it's interesting, the root word kind of connected to kara is the Greek word charis, Tom and Don, of course, last name, but that's not who we're talking about today, right? Charis, which means grace, right? So it's interesting that joy is rooted in a word that also means grace, unconditional love, and you get how all of this kind of connects together. So uh, in my household, uh, Christmas was an important time, and uh, my mother was big at uh, Christmas decorations and Christmas trees and and gifts, and one of my mom's uh, famous abilities was to guess a Christmas gift, and some of you know this story, and, and uh, my mother could guess a gift on Christmas Eve easily. That's when we opened our gifts, and she somehow had the ability to shake or hold or lift a package and immediately name what it was, and, and, and you'd think that would be fun, but it wasn't, right? It, it, brought, it brought great consternation to all of us, including my father. So that, as you can imagine, there were these great attempts uh, to throw her off, you know, so wrapping small gifts in large b b uh, boxes and putting weights in them to make her think or putting jars of water so she heard that, those sounds, trying to throw her off. It, it was really a part of our family tradition. And nonetheless, 95% approval rate for my mom. She could do this, like she could get it right. And we began to suspect, and I think it's true, that when we were at school and my dad was at work, my mother actually unwrapped gifts with a steamer that she owned because there were signs that this might be true because extra tape, one time a gift got rewrapped, she said something happened, I think she did it. So anyway, all kinds of attempts to throw her off. Well, one Christmas, I think I was in fifth grade, my dad decided that he was going to do whatever he could. We didn't know this. My mom wanted to watch that Christmas. She had said it about 15 million times. Uh, we used to have a thing called uh, the Sears catalog. You might know about it. And she would mark it and circle it, and then she would do it also in the best catalog and the service merchandise catalog and all those places. And, uh, and so she was really being clear about the watch she wanted. But the night of Christmas Eve came, and of course my mom's guest rate was really high that night, and she came to the last gift from my father. It was the tradition that was the last gift to be opened, and it was a beautiful gift box of cologne and perfume, right? And you could just see her face, you know what I'm talking about? Kind of crestfallen, oh, thank you so much. But she was really <laughs> devastated because she thought this watch was coming. So uh, my dad said, well, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, and my mom says, Merry Christmas, yeah. And my dad said, well, there's one more gift. And my mom lit up. 
but you could tell there was also a sense of panic that she had not found it or didn't know it existed. And my dad said, yes, this year is a new year. You cannot guess what I've done. And he goes outside in his pajamas, in his bathrobe, to get this gift that he's put in the planter, that he's hid at his office all this season, and it's not there. Now, the thing you need to know is we got a new puppy that year named Bambi, and Bambi found the gift early, and it became clear from shreds of gift paper that he had taken it somewhere on the farm and buried it, right? You know? <laughs> so my dad, of course, is devastated, and he said, I can't believe this. So he wouldn't let my mother come outside, but here his three children, my sister was still pretty young, in our pajamas went out into the cold to find this gift across the farm. But as you can guess, my mom eventually made it out. And I remember she said to my dad, Weldon, you're going to have to tell us what the gift is so we can find it. And he paused for a long time. <laughs> and he said, you win again. It's a watch. And she was just filled with glee. I mean, she was so happy, even though we couldn't find it, right? Well, the end of the story is, Later on, we did find it buried out by the barn, and we brought it back in, and my mother rejoiced in that, but she said, I won once again, right? <laughs> so she was filled with joy. My dad was not. In fact, the rest of the evening was a bit somber. I didn't really know if Santa Claus was going to come or not. You know, it was one of those nights. And uh, the next morning, we gathered for Christmas breakfast, which is our tradition, and we opened the final gifts, and Santa comes, and all that kind of stuff, and my dad is not in a good place. And my sister starts giggling because she can't get over the story that my dad forced us into the cold to find this watch. And she brings it up, and my mom starts laughing. And then the two of us, my brother and I, start laughing. And my dad finally cracks a smile, and then we just start laughing. Now, what's funny about that story is that's what we remember about Christmas in our family. Not the watch, not the other gifts we received over the years. I don't even remember what I received that year. But I remember that story not from my dad's disdain or my mother's victory at guessing another gift, but the great joy it brought us that morning. And then every time we gather, that story's told, and there's a deep sense of laughter. And no matter what the tension is at the holiday table, and we have it, rest assured, somebody will tell that story and we will laugh. And there'll be a deep sense of happiness and joy at laughing at that moment when everything fell apart but it didn't. I think that is what uh, this, uh, this Cairo joy that we talk about, Kara, is really about. Joy is more than a quick smile or something funny for a moment. Kara is a deep sense of thanksgiving and praise and uh, happiness that sustains us even when things are not too joyful. In today's passage, which is just one of my favorites, we hear the story of Mary's Annunciation, the announcement from the angel Gabriel that she will bear a son. As you remember from two weeks ago, she was engaged to Joseph. They were all set, and then she, he finds out that she's pregnant, and he's going to leave her, but in the end, he doesn't. Do you remember the story? But in this story, Luke's version, uh, uh, Mary is uh, visited by Gabriel also, this heavenly messenger, that's what angels were, who tells her that she has been chosen. Now, Mary lives in a backwater town called Nazareth. She has no real uh, status, for se. She's a very young girl. And this angel reveals to her that she will not only have a baby, but this baby will be the Son of God, and this will be the Messiah, and she is to name him Jesus. Now, unlike Joseph's wrestling piece, or earlier Zechariah's uncertainty about the coming of John the Baptist, Mary pretty much accepts it. I mean, she has some questions about how is this going to happen, and I'm concerned about what people are going to think. But in the end, once Gabriel gives her some answers, she says, okay, I receive it. I'm glad to do it. I'm honored to do it. I, I rejoice in that. And, and, and she does that. And, I, and then the angel reveals to her that her cousin, Elizabeth, who's much older than she, who lives in a different town, in a different part of the country, in the hill country of Judea, that she's pregnant already, and, and then lives this, that wonderful phrase that often gets lifted out of context, nothing is impossible with God. Do you remember that? But it's in this context of a woman without power, without possibility, and an older woman who's barren, and you know in uh, Jewish culture she had no standing. Here it's in the context of this that Gabriel says, nothing is impossible with God. But it's a mess. Controversy about Mary's pregnancy, Elizabeth's having a baby in her 70s or 80s, people are talking, you know, down at the 
cafe or in the you know, junior league group or whatever. You know what I'm saying? It's a mess. And yet in the midst of the mess, Mary says yes. And then I just think this is fabulous. Mary finds out this news. And frankly, if it had been me or I think I would have gone into hiding, right? That's what Elizabeth did. But Mary takes off on a journey, which is sort of risky. It's a, it's a, it's a decent journey. And she travels to Elizabeth's house because, you know, sometimes when you're in the same boat, it's nice to be together, right? There's a sense of camaraderie and encouragement and support for one another. And so beauty, beauty, beautiful thing that, that Mary travels to her. And then there's that wonderful story which you heard Laura read that uh, Mary enters and greets uh, Elizabeth in Zechariah's house and the baby, John the Baptist, leaps, leaps in Elizabeth's womb. And it's sort of connected, do you remember Jacob and Esau wrestling in the womb? All this gets connected together. And, and so here there's this leaping and Elizabeth recognizes that she's been filled with the Holy Spirit and so is Mary and she says a really important phrase that we gloss over quickly. How is it that I'm so honored to have my, the mother of my Lord be present in this place. Elizabeth is the first person. Elizabeth, a barren woman who has no status, who has no power. She's the woman who claims Christ is Lord. She knows who Jesus is before anybody else gets it. And Luke does that intentionally. Then the two of them just rejoice together, right? And Elizabeth offers a small song of praise and joy. And then Mary launches into this long song that we call the Magnificat. And that just means magnifies. I magnify my Lord. She's worshiping God. And it's interesting, and I'd encourage you to read the song today. Um, it's a beautiful song in which Mary says a little bit about herself being chosen, how honored she is. But Mary, we learn a lot about her. She immediately moves into a song that resembles that of Hannah. Remember when she became pregnant with Samuel in the Old Testament or Hebrew Scripture? She sings this song, and it, it moves from her to those on the margins. The poor will be taken care of. The, the hungry will be fed. Those in power will lose everything they have. And those at the bottom rung will move up. Everything gets reversed. So the joy, the song of joy that she sings is not so much about herself, but that Jesus' is coming will reverse the world order and throw economic and power systems upside down. Amen? Hello, come on. Amen, right? But what I love about this story is not only the song of joy, not only the song that reverses the order of power, and not only the song that lifts two women with no power whatsoever and this culture that would have minimized them to the very end, that they're lifted up as the key part of launching this beautiful story of the birth of Savior and the birth of John the Baptist and this beautiful journey of salvation. Amen? But what I love is the joy the two of them share. So I would say as we enter into this season of joy and of Advent, that part of our role is a role of encouraging each other, right? It's almost a Mary Elizabeth relationship, and that we become the encouragers for one another, and especially those on the edges and margins and brokenness, that it's our call to be Elizabeth and Mary to others, to lift them up and to give them joy. Not something simple or shallow, but something deep and sustaining, even in our darkest hour. Amen? And so it's easy for us in this season to be the critic. Amen? Oh, that tree looks horrible. Is this the gift you really bought me? And you don't have to say it. Everybody sees your face, right? Or you worry about whether you're going to get the same gift that somebody else gets, you know, or, you know, all these kinds of things that happen, or just the negativity of the busyness of the season. And you could do, you and I could easily become the critic, amen? amen? Really. But what if we committed ourselves in this next week as we celebrate joy that we will be the source of kara, of joy, of grace, that we will be the ones who offer a word of encouragement and companionship instead of criticism or what's wrong? What would it mean for us to receive that gift from Aunt Mary that is atrocious and just rejoice like we never have? Amen? Amen. Or what if we gave up a few gifts and spent that money elsewhere or helped a family in need or, or did something different that points us toward this deeper gift of joy? I love this story. I love reading it every year 
because it's a story of two women who companion together and encourage each other in the midst of such a mess. Amen? And in the midst of that mess is a deep sense of kara, joy, charis, a deep sense that in the midst of whatever we face, joy, the joy of Christ, will sustain us always. And the people of God said, Will you please stand? So I hope you'll take time to reflect on the beauty of the symbols before us, including the poinsettias. There's a beautiful list of those who these flowers have been given in memory and honor and celebration of. So they represent more than just the Star of Bethlehem. These represent lives and people that are dear to us. Amen? Amen. And so for as you go forth from this place into this world, may joy undergird you. May joy surround you. May it be the joy of laughter and fellowship and friends and family. May it be the joy of dancing and celebrating and enjoying the fullness of life. But may it also be that joy, that kara rooted in grace that's deep and sustaining and encourages others in the midst of brokenness. And even when things seem like a mess, that joy lifts us and sustains us and shines in our life. Because that joy is the joy of Jesus. Let us go forth in Christ's name. Amen.